I assure the rest of you are as eager as I am to hear what Scott's going to have to say about this, uh, especially uh, seeing as how uh, he is the man with the finger on the pulse of psychotherapy uh, from a global and international perspective. So will you please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Scott Miller. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I am Scott, and I'm pleased to be with you all. Um, here in Anaheim today to talk about this topic. Um, I am the director of the International Center for Clinical Excellence. Um, that, this organization was actually launched um, right here in 2009 at the Evolution of Psychotherapy Conference. And in the last uh, four years, uh, has grown into the largest web-based organization of mental health professionals in the world. Thousands of clinicians, practitioners, educators, and researchers meet daily uh, to learn from one another. And I really do hope that you will join us in the conversation. It's free. There are no costs. There are no secret hidden levels of premium content. Um, and it's also ad-free. So you're not going to get bombarded with ads for books or purchasing videos, etc. And in many ways, this topic of excellence is related to what I'd like to talk about in this particular address. Um, all that I do talk about, everything I cover, you can find on my website, which is at scottdmiller.com. If you are tweeting from this particular presentation, and I hope you will, make sure you put the hashtag uh, EVO, EVO 2013, and also the ICCE's Twitter account name, at the ICCE, um, during the process. So here we are, um, 2013, nearly three decades since the first Evolution Conference, the stated purpose of which was to track the development in our field. Evolution is defined as the gradual development of something, especially from a simple to a more complex form. Progress, defined as forward movement. Well, have we evolved then? In order to answer that question, um, I would like to have us all enter a time machine and go backwards about 30 years to the sixth, leaving today, Anaheim, the sixth evolution conference and going all the way back to 1985. Were you there? Cool. I was there too. I was a young second year grad student in psychology. I filled out my papers and was so excited uh, to be there and to serve as a volunteer, to wear a red hat. Um, so grateful to be able to meet many of the folks that I was studying and hoping to learn from and certainly wanted to emulate. Many of my heroes were there. Um, I listened and met both Carl Rogers and Virginia Satir. I have to tell you, they were every bit as great as it, they seem today. I was in the room when R.D. Lang interviewed a young psychotic woman. Uh, the interview was confusing and intriguing at the same time. And I listened as Bruno Bettelheim commented on his speech, criticizing the work that R.D. Lang had done to which R.D., when asked to respond, simply leaned forward to the microphone and cried. I thought it was a perfect response to being beat up by a smart guy. I saw the testy debate between Masterson and Haley, the time when Haley was saying psychoanalysis was dead. And Masterson replied, Mr. Haley, and then stopped and said, it is Mr., right? Not doctor. <laughs> it's fantastic. You're looking for that shit to happen when you come to a thing like this. I even sat stunned, maybe you were there, when Ernest Rossi disrobed in front of the entire audience. Thousands of people watched him strip down to his underwear. He was demonstrating what it took to have a memorable impact on people. <laughs> I, I have to tell you, I remember it to this day, although I can't remember what a thing of what he said after that. 
It was a heady experience, one that left me feeling excited about the future and anticipating the developments to come. So what's happened? Have we evolved over the last 30 years? Well, the number of models has certainly increased. The number of treatment approaches from 60 to over 400. There have been thousands of books published telling us all how to do therapy and do it better. And there are more diagnostic specific treatment approaches, lists and manuals, supposedly teaching us what we need to know to be more effective. The problem with all of this is that if you look at the research literature dating back all the way to the mid-70s and all the way forward to the present year, 2013, there has been really some good news. That good news is that most studies indicate that what we do works. Average treated client better off than 80% of the untreated sample. If you've seen me speak before at the conference, you know that the outcome of behavioral health services rivals, and in most cases exceeds, medical treatments. And on average, we mental health professionals, average folks working in our offices every day trying to help people, we achieve outcomes that are on par with those obtained in tightly controlled, randomized clinical trials. In other words, the outcomes are good. That's the good news. The bad news is there has been no improvement in treatment outcome over that same time period. None, zero, zip, nada. We've tried desperately to get better, but the outcomes are not getting better. 1976, just take a moment and think back if you were even there in 1976. Think of the clothes you were wearing, how you dialed your phone, no desktop computers, your car that you were driving, and your hairstyle. You still look that same way in 2013, still wearing those same clothes, still having those same outcomes. So if the question is, have we evolved? I guess you would have to say we've definitely evolved. We have moved from simple to more complex forms. This conference is a testament to the complexity of the work. If you listen and move from room to room, you hear just how difficult this all is, sorting it out, what to do once you leave, even more complicated. The lack of improvement in our outcomes, I'm hoping will force us to ask, maybe we have evolved, but have we progressed? The answer to this question, I think, is less satisfying. And there is other research. That other research indicates that the effectiveness of the average clinician that's guys like me, people like you, plateau very early in their career. I mentioned on Wednesday how early that is, that clinicians actually begin to plateau. It's about 50 hours of direct service. 50 hours of direct service and you have achieved your life's pursuit of an effective therapist. There's even more troubling findings, and that is that there's little or no difference in outcome between professionals, students, and minimally trained paraprofessionals. Now don't kill me, I'm only the messenger. But it should be quite a concern to all of us that despite all of our hard work, we're just not achieving better outcomes. And it's not only that. It's not that our outcomes have remained flat, but I would argue that in fact, our profession has been losing ground, actually. When you look at what's happening to average therapists practicing, especially in the United States, but elsewhere that I travel, you have to know that therapists' incomes are in serious decline. Factoring in inflation, the therapists are earning one-third of what they earned 10 to 15 years ago. Increasingly, direct services are provided by minimally trained support personnel. It's a drag when you think about it, and that's not all the bad news. More bad news. Here's the other bad news. Use of psychotherapy during that same time indicates that we are in a steep decline. In the last decade, use of psychotherapy has declined by 35%. At the same time, use of pharmaceuticals have increased by 75%. It's not that our customers don't want to improve their lives. It's simply they're choosing other options. 
that are perhaps easier, less time consuming, et cetera. Given these findings, can we really conclude that we're making progress? No appreciable improvement in our outcomes in a 37 year period. Average clinicians do not improve over time and they achieve outcomes on par with success rates obtained by minimally trained paraprofessionals, not to mention our incomes, et cetera. You have to wonder, is this the definition of progress or is this the definition of something else? I would say maybe it's the definition of extinction. The state or the process of a species or family or a larger group becoming extinct, dying out, disappearing. You know, when I talk to therapists about this, this whole phenomenon that's happening in our field, I hear a lot of ideas about what might be happening. And it's usually no surprise when I build, bring up our incomes, et cetera, the difficulty our field is having in making advances as compared to medicine. And I say, why do you think this is? And here's what I hear. Well, I hear, how can you compete with big pharma? Insurance companies have cut us off at the knees. Society is more complex. The problems are more difficult. Hey, some say the field is good enough. People that we treat now, they just want a quick fix. Some say to me, hey, Scott, I like what you said and the way you say it, but the research is just wrong. We are more effective. Well, I think we can propose an analogy here. And the analogy might be to the dodo. The dodo bird, now extinct. The bird was about a meter tall and weighed about 10 to 20 kilos. It had no natural predators. And although few humans actually considered the dodo bird tasty, it was easily hunted by humans because it couldn't fly. Within 200 years of contact with our species, around 1693 on the Isle of Mauritius in the Indian Ocean, it was gone, nevermore. Now, humans who hunted the bird to extinction without mercy or foresight, you know, we have to take some credit for their extinction, some of the blame. We were one of, if not the primary causes of their demise. At the same time, their inability to fly contributed to the problem. In evolutionary terms, flight is a very costly adaptation. Birds have some of the highest metabolic rates. Walking consumes much less energy. And without any natural predators, you have to ask yourself, why do it? Why fly? And so over time, it stopped flying. And it decided, why build our nest high up in a tree or on a cliff where our chicks could fall out, where we had to fly up there to feed them, when they can be built just the same on the ground? And with no natural predators, it was a reasonable development. Then circumstances changed. Humans moved in. And I'm proposing that in our field, circumstances have changed. In a parallel fashion, we gave up flight long ago. Being on our own was costly to us. And so we decided to connect with another brother field, the field of medicine. And we have, throughout most of our history, focused in a medical kind of way on creating a psychological formulary. Methods believed to contain specific healing ingredients remedial to the condition being treated, the diagnosis we had to address, or the underlying pathology. The belief being if you didn't apply that specific method to that underlying pathological process, the client wouldn't be healed. It seemed like a very reasonable adaptation to give up our own professional identity and link the field of psychotherapy with medicine, to hang out. They were successful after all. But I'm going to say to you that I think it's time to admit it's not worked out so well for us. Psychotherapy works, there's no doubt. How can we expect to survive the changing practice environment by continuing with more of the same? You have to wonder, did the dodo birds ever think, damn, we shouldn't have given up flight? Maybe not. 
we should be thinking, damn, what do we need to do differently now? If we don't stop doing more of the same, what are we going to do? Short of restoring flight, what can we do? Well, think about this for a second. Evolution, we know, occurs at the individual level. Now, for those of you who are expert in this field, I know there's some controversy about individual versus group evolution. Just hang with me for a minute. Because I'm going to argue that we've been studying the wrong thing. The evolution of psychotherapy makes no sense to me. The field doesn't evolve by models. It evolves because of you. And we should be talking more about the evolution of psychotherape psychotherapists rather than psychotherapy. Who cares what happens to our models, et cetera? What we should be ensuring is that each of us survive to reproduce other little therapists in the future. <laughs> evolution occurs at that individual level. The field could begin to focus on you, the therapist, your evolution, and your development. Here's what we know from the research and it's not a small amount of research. It's decades and decades of research pointing at the same thing. But once again, we're running like the dodo, having given up flight, lined up with medicine, thinking in the same way we've thought since our field's inception. Here's what the research says. Models don't do therapy. Therapists do therapy. And some therapists achieve consistently better results than others. Let that sink in. Maybe we should be asking ourselves a different question. Instead of what model should I use, what do the better therapists do in our field to achieve those outcomes? After all, on the Isle of Mauritius, the birds that can fly are still there. The dodo is gone. Differences between therapists account for between 5 to 9% of the variability in treatment outcomes. Now you may think, that's not very much. Let me tell you, it's enough variability to drive a truck through. It's huge, and let me put it in perspective. It's five to nine times greater than the variability attributable to the treatment approach. So maybe we should put us in focus. And the differences between the best and the rest of us continue. They persist when re researchers control for things like comp competence. In other words, we make sure that the treatments are manualized. When experts watching us work can't tell the difference between the model being used, it's rated equally competent. And when they do that, the differences between therapists persist. Those differences are unrelated to age, gender, caseload, theoretical orientation, social skills, emotional intelligence, professional degree, years of experience, or years or time spent conducting therapy. I hope I'm making a strong argument that we need to look else, elsewhere. When experts cannot tell the difference in quality between the outcome uh, or between the treatment model being used and yet the, tr the differences persist, maybe it's not about the model. Maybe it's about something else, that unique quality of that particular provider. Now, I'm not the first to make this argument. There have been many that have come before me, starting all the way back with Les Laborski in the 1950s. He wrote a chapter uh, about qualities of effective therapists. It was brilliant work. Not a single person picked up on it after he started creating this list until much later when Don Meichenbaum created his own list of qualities of master therapists. One of the first people to do a quantitative study about master therapists and their, the qualities of superior therapists was a psychologist by the name of David F. Ricks. I don't have a picture of David Ricks. There isn't one any place to be found. But David F. Ricks did a study in 1974, about the time we started measuring treatment outcomes. 1974, David followed up with adults who'd been treated as children in the New York State mental health care system. He yoked the clients, looking, in other words, comparing clients that were equally severe in their presenting problems and complaints. And what he wanted to find out was why did some of these adults treated as children, why were they surviving and thriving? Why were they living good lives while others were in jail, in prison, on welfare, or dead? What was the difference? Can you guess what he found? Who treated them? 
That was the difference. If they'd been treated by this therapist, they were doing well. If they were treated by that one, they were much more likely to be among the unsuccessfully treated clients. 1974 is when the study took place. It's a fairly scary finding when you think about it. I guess that's why not a single person looked at his research for 30 more years. <laughs> it's the third rail of our profession that what really matters is not your model but you that you make the critical difference in your clients' lives, not the model that you happen to practice, as I said before. That's when Mike Lambert picked up this, uh, along with colleagues David Vermeersch and Okishi, and began measuring the outcomes of therapists and reported that in what David F. Ricks had found back in 1974 was true. Some clinicians were reliably better than others. Once again, few people picked up Michael's research. I should tell you one more thing about David F. Ricks. When he was doing his study, which was called Super Shrinks, that particular study, he did not coin that term, Super Shrinks, and neither did I, although we've used it uh, liberally in the articles we published. Actually, it was one of the adults he interviewed told him that the kids at the institution had coined the term about one of the psychologists there. And David said, uh, David was talking to this adult, treated as a child, and asked about this person. Well, they said, we called him the super shrink. And we actually began telling other kids, make sure you avoid the other guy. <laughs> because he's a real stinker. Don Meikenbaum created a list during the heyday of CBT. Saul Garfield wrote that reminding the field about the importance of examining the practitioner, he too was ignored. Bandler and Grinder, of course, wrote their series, uh, The Structure of Magic, where they were basing it on uh, people, master therapists, who we all believed were quite effective. Now, there was one problem about all of this research, with one exception, and that's Lambert's data. None of the studies, none of the studies that looked at this phenomena, with the exceptions of Lambert and David F. Ricks, provided concrete evidence of what top performing clinicians actually did how they achieved their results, nor proof that they were actually more effective. Instead, for example, in the list created by Laborski and Don Meikenbaum, you were voted to be a master therapist by your peers. This has nothing to do with outcome and all to do with reputation, and the two things may not go together in any reliable way. Finally, there was a long-term study uh, by two of my heroes, Michael Rönnestad from Norway and David Orlinski at the University of Chicago. They did an, a 20-year study of 11,000 therapists looking at their professional development. And here's what they found, quite striking. Without exception, therapists see themselves as developing over their careers. The problem with Rönnestad and Orlinski's study is there was no proof we actually developed. Plus, if you look at other data, it turns out that we therapists overestimate our effectiveness routinely. We see ourselves in a kind of Lake Wobegon way, believing that we are more effective than we are. The average therapist, think about this, believes that they are more effective than 80% of their peers. Now, you may object and say, but isn't that true of a lot of professions? And I say, yes. Does that make you feel better? <laughs> it is true. By the way, would you like to know the profession that most vastly overestimates its competence in relationship to its peers? Would you like to know? College professors. The average college professor believes that they are better, smarter than 90% of their peers. I guess that's why they have office hours. Well, our team struggled for a long time because we actually had been measuring outcomes for nearly a decade. And we did find, like Lambert, that some therapists were better than others. But we were completely lost as to how to understand this until we ran across a Swedish researcher by the name of K. Anders Ericsson. K. Anders Ericsson has written this fabulous, massive tome called the Cambridge Handbook of Expertise and Expert Performance. He's studied experts in chess, music, art, science, medicine, mathematics, history, computer programming. 
And what he found was quite interesting. He found that the process that led to the development of expertise across these different domains was largely the same. Not different. We had to get outside our box, however, in order to figure that out. So we've decided that many of us suffered from the streetlight phenomenon. You may have heard this. If you were at the first evolution conference and listened to Paul Václavic, he told this story. You've heard it. There's a man that is looking, who is looking around underneath a street light. A police officer happens by and says, what are you doing? He says, I'm looking for my keys. And the police officer says, well, did you lose them here? He says, no, I lost them over there. The policeman says, why are you looking here? He says, the light is better here. The light is better. And we were doing the same thing with psychotherapy. We were stuck in, with the street light phenomenon. I think our field in many ways is stuck looking in the most obvious place for where the effectiveness of treatment happens. We've assumed that we have to look where the light is brightest. We interviewed therapists. We watched videos of them at work. We studied their demographics, their age, their gender, their experience, their approach. Statistically, we controlled for severity to ensure that those who were measurably better were actually better and not because they were simply working with easier, less challenging clients. And what did we find? Nothing. We found nothing. I can't tell you how many mind-numbing, nauseatingly boring videos of expert therapists I watched trying to find out what the hell were they doing in there. Plus, half the time I watched it and thought, this is shit. <laughs> it doesn't even look good. It's disorganized. They stop and start. They act confused. Maybe being disorganized is the key to being an effective therapist. The point here is we studied everything that was lit aptly, lit brightly. The stuff inside the box, the method, the diagnosis, the therapist, the client, their interpersonal interaction. Erickson's discovery was quite different. He said that what separates the best and the rest was not necessarily what occurs in the box. Once you've achieved a reliable average performance, that won't make you any better trying to redo what you already do. Instead, he said, what separates the best from the rest is what they do before and after their sessions. How they spent their time, something that Erickson called deliberate practice. When we broke therapists, when we broke the outcomes of therapists in, in our research into quartiles, um, we found that certain therapists emerged if they did this deliberate practice is more effective. Deliberate, what does it mean? Conscious and intentionally. Practice, carrying out a particular activity uh, repetitiously and regularly. And how does it look when you look at therapist outcomes? This is from the only study in the treatment literature at the current time. Deliberate practice is the hours you spend alone seriously engaging in activities designed to improve your therapeutic skills. Not what you did in the room, but what you did before and after you left your room or came to that room. And if you look at the top performing therapists in our study, they spent 14 times more hours outside of practice, something we call practice outside of practice deliberately practicing, practicing alone, trying to improve their skills. Now, Erickson had already been here. We just didn't know it. We were too busy looking where the light was bright. But Erickson had been researching, for example, violinists um, and how they acquire their skills. Take a look at this particular graphic. He'd also studied um, uh, a piano, chess, surgery, radiography, teaching, programming, soccer, et cetera. Now you may be thinking, you may be thinking, well, some of these things, surgery, there's a set procedure and a set skill, very easy to measure. If you're thinking that psychotherapy is more like an art, I usually say people deem things an art when they weren't there for the million strokes that were made to paint the picture. Then you think it's an art. You're seeing the finished product. Uh, and radiography, try thinking 
try uh, reading a radiographic film. This takes exceptional talent. You'll often hear radiologists say what an art form it is to be able to reliably improve your performance. So take a look at, this happens to be for violin players over the course of their careers, and he's broken them in two thirds. The, at the beginning, when they first start, their first year of practice playing the violin, you can see that there's virtually no difference between the three groups. Over time, each of the groups begins to separate in terms of their performance as judged by expert judges using standardized scales playing the violin. And by the way, this graph is for violins. The graph looks the same, whether it's violins, piano, chess, uh, or any of, these other, uh, any of these other areas. So as you can see, by their fourth year, they have spent nearly seven times more hours than the less proficient or bottom third violin players. It's a shocking difference. Now, would you like to see therapists? Daryl Chow did a, uh, an incredible job having therapists plot how they spent their time over the first eight years of their career. And here's the graph. Put them side by side, again broken into thirds. That is the therapist at year eight of their practice with the best outcomes are the blue line. 3,500 hours of practice outside of practice by their eighth year. Compare that to the bottom third. The bottom third have spend 14 and a half less hours, uh, 14 and a half times less hours or fewer hours uh, practicing outside of practice. Here's the cruel part, both get paid the same for their work. It's strange really uh, that our field continues this way. And just take a look. Again, the graphs look surprisingly similar to the work by Erickson from other performance domains. We were no longer in the box as researchers searching in vain under the street lamp. So, deliberate practice. What should you do if you want to deliberately practice? What should you do? How should you spend your time? This was the question we all wondered about. And we didn't realize that when we were asking ourselves this question, we were caught in the very medical model that we'd struggled to escape. As if there was something we could all each do that was the same that would push our outcomes into the top third of performers. We created a massive inventory, had clinicians report in detail each week how they spent their time looking for the thing, the one thing we could all do. When it came back, here's what we found. They simply spent more time doing it, whatever that happened to be. There seemed to be two general kinds of things they worked at. The first one was they spent a lot more time studying and restudying the basics. It's very easy once you've mastered the basics to think you should move on to the advanced stuff. What Erickson found was that the best physicists actually spent time reading and rereading basic papers in the field, basic texts. When was the last time you reread Gerard Egan's The Helping Professional or Corey's book on the helping relationship? This is where you should spend part of your time outside of your practice. Engagement skills, core counseling process. The other thing they did was they spent a lot of time studying and identifying small process errors. Their failures to connect with this individual client. Why? Because the errors aren't something that is ubiquitous across therapists. They're specific to your knowledge base. So in order for you to get better, in order for you to evolve, you have to figure out what is it you don't do well. In order to find that out, you have to look closely. You have to measure. For each practitioner, the specifics varied. Um, they tended to work, uh, the top performers tended to work at the edge of their realm of reliable performance. Reliable performance, take a look at the graphic up here. The, the edge of your ability. Um, if you're down on the left-hand side, it's when it's too easy. You don't really have to think. You can execute the processes quickly and automatically. Now, if you remember when you were a student, for those of you who are already in the field, you can remember what it was like to struggle with the basics, just to figure out what to say. 
Now they're executed quickly and automatically. All you have to do is recognize, retrieve, and then execute your action. Are you with me here? This stuff you don't have to think about, which is why you don't get better at it, because we're just doing it automatically. In order to improve, we have to find that zone of proximal development where your reliable performance is inconsistent. Let me give you a hint about where you'll find that. The next time you describe your client as resistant or difficult, that's your edge. Because your client isn't difficult, it's just you're not engaging that particular client in a useful activity. That's where I would practice right at that edge. You have to identify those errors and misperceptions. Set small process and outcome objectives. What do I mean by that? Writing out specifically what you're going to try to do the next time you meet that particular client. Top performers don't wing it. They simply don't wing it. They push themselves to the edge and they consciously and deliberately plan for what they're going to do next. They plan, they rehearse, and they reflect on their work. Now, if you're like me, when you're at a conference like this, I spend most of my time listening to other professionals, not in the too easy range realm of reliable performance, and not in the zone of proximal development. I spend my time at these presentations in the ambit of admiration. The ambit of admiration is when you're watching these clinicians work and you think, holy shit, I could never do this. And what happens when you're in the ambit of admiration? The ability of others appear flawless, magical, and dramatic. Let me just ask, has anybody felt that way yet at the Evolution Conference? These things just get spun magically, and we are transfixed by it, hypnotized. I've got to learn that. Here's the truth. You can't. You can't possibly learn to do what they did. Effort and attention get focused on easily recognized things, but they are usually non-causal factors and processes. We leave with superstitious behavior, in other words, things that don't really lead to any difference, and we risk the risk of failure and injury is high. If you are in the ambit of admiration and you go home and try this stuff, chances are you may do more harm than good. Why is that? Let me give you another story. Championship figure skaters. Anders Ericsson studied these folks in the last, uh, in the tour in 2006 Tour and Olympics. He found, he had them measure their time, how they spent their time on ice, when they practiced. And they found that the top gold medal winners spent much more time practicing in the zone of proximal development. Whereas, Bronze and uh, lower uh, spent more time performing the parts of the routine they did well. Am I making sense? Then there were a few people who were injured and couldn't then go to the Olympics. Where were they? They were doing stuff that was too far beyond their ability. Finding that sweet spot really requires caution, care, and thought. Where do my reliably administered practices begin to break down? That's what I need to study and work on um, improving. Those top performing therapists measure on an ongoing basis. Our team provides measures that you can use. You can use the ORS and the SRS. Are they the best measures on the planet? Absolutely not. And I hope our field doesn't get in a fight about which measure we should be using. That, I think, would be silliness. Use the OQ. Use the Beck Depression Inventory. Whatever it is you use, start using it regularly. After your therapy, reflect. What was it that I didn't do well? Here's one other skill I talked about in the REACH presentation. Take a moment, this conference, and think about the last time you delivered a session where you were doing your level best. When you think it was a good representation of you doing your best work, then write a thick description of that session. Everything you said, the client did back and forth. Set that aside. Let it be for a week. After a week, take that description, and after each session you have, look at it and ask yourself, how did I fall short of my best work today? And keep a list of that. You're likely to get closer to your zone of proximal development. 
Again, lots of other areas where this has been shown. So, the best. They deliver a more reliably effective and less variable treatment process. When we look at them and the work that they do, they also achieve 50% better outcomes than average performers. And we believe that what they do is applicable to all in our quest to evolve as a profession and as professionals. What do we need to do? Spend more time in deliberate practice, each of us evolving one at a time focused on our heirs. How can we help each other? Do it together. Work together at helping each other identify those errors and figure out what we're going to do next. Thanks very much. Thank you. I, we do have a few minutes left. If you would like to uh, ask questions, I ask that you move to the microphone. I'm more than willing to take those questions. Um, and then we can, I know, adjourn for lunch. So our, if there are questions, feel free to come on up. Yes. Yes. My question is on your group of top performers. Yes. I really see psychotherapists being in a completely different category for the one reason that we get trained, we go in a room, nobody sees what we do, so we don't get the on-going feedback yeah. that all the other performers that you mentioned do get because they're public. So one concern is, is that. And then the other concern with the deliberate practice, which I fully agree with and fully would endorse, is are we sufficient self-observers to understand the technology of what works and doesn't work in psychotherapy to be good self-observers to do that, that work? It's one of the, it's, both of these are great comments. Let me answer them in a unified way, and that is, in order to be able to see what our errors are, you will have to measure. So you're going to have to get feedback from the person who's always there when you do psychotherapy, your client. Mm -hmm. That means using some standardized form to find out, are you making progress? And if not, what do I need to do? Secondly, and probably more importantly, have I engaged you with whatever stuff I'm spinning in the room, whatever style I happen to do? That's one start. To do the deliberate practice piece, I couldn't agree with you more. You need to be watched by somebody whose skills you admire and want to emulate and whose outcomes are known. So two pieces. Now, you also highlight one third piece. What's in it for me? Because let's just admit, money and time are scarce. And this is going to cost both in order to get better at your work. And the chances are you won't get paid anymore. I'm asking you to think beyond that to the field's evolution. We really need to move our outcomes to a different level. We can't stay the same. We need to reach people that are currently dropping out of care. Thanks Thank for that. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Um, you had indicated that when we were looking at what differentiates experts, that it was uh, time alone spent in practice. Is there, is there an emphasis on alone there? There is the emphasis on alone outside of practice. And here's the reason. Uh, you can't get better at therapy while you're doing therapy. And the reason is the key ingredient that needs to be there can't. You have to consciously reflect on your work. And when you're doing therapy, and clients don't stop talking so you can think. They don't. So you are relying on what you know and what you can improvise at the moment, which is really quite good. Remember, I said our outcomes are good. But if you want to get better, it requires an additional step. And that's the time to reflect. Not only just reflect, but also plan. And I'm talking about making a specific plan to improve in a very small area. If you do that, then your outcomes will slowly move up. And I'm talking slowly. Don't expect any big, giant movement in your practice, because once you've made the Olympic trials, the difference between the best and the rest are very small, but make all the difference in the world. Yes. yes. Uh, over here. I'm sorry. Here. Here. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in the interaction between the basics and the fundamentals that you talk about. Yes. And the uh, fascination with, uh, this particularly usually comes from academia, but even more so in terms of um, insurance companies as far as evidence-based practice, blah, blah, blah. Um, in terms of what the new flavor or the model of the month is, you know, that now some research has come out and oh, and, and I notice this in academia, it's like they don't 
let's just discard satire and so on and so forth because there wasn't enough research there and we want, here's the most recent research and, and the like. Um, and then also one's own uh, natural curiosity as a therapist in terms of how is it that I could do something different here that could be more effective. Is, could you talk about the, the th interplay of those three, the fundamentals versus the fascination with novelty versus the fas and recent research and one's own natural curiosity that is trying to learn more? I think it would be good to deliberately practice all of those things, especially if your uh, measurement of your work shows you to be lacking with that client. Okay. But yeah. to, the, to talk about them generally and abstractly, I think this is the problem. I see. The problem is that most of these very general cognitive kind of um, uh, themes, paradigms, mm -hmm. methods, they're, they're far too decontextualized to make any difference to that individual client. The experts, I like, I like to say, when I talk to somebody like Wendy, who I showed on Wednesday, who's this top performing clinician, if you say to Wendy something like, well, um, how do you work with a depressed person? Wendy will look at you with a, with a dumbfounded look on her face. She, she doesn't even know how to start the question or start the answer, but she'll say, how old is this person? Is it a male or a female? Where do they live? She's, you know, what's their zodiac sign? They mm -hmm. could ask all sorts of stuff that I have no idea why this is important to her, and then suddenly out pops this highly contextualized thing. So I like to say that Wendy is a person who has lots in her house and she knows how to find it when she needs it. The rest of us, me included, have the same amount of shit in our house, but it's all cluttered. And so when we need it, we can't find it anyway. And what do we do? We go buy the same thing again. Because we needed it at that moment. Have you had that experience in your house, by the way? You have 20 of the same thing because you can never find the last one you bought. That's called continuing education. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Are you aware of any research about therapists being in therapy themselves yes. and whether that improves their performance as a therapist? No difference. Thank you. No difference. No difference. No difference. And if you think about it, it should make sense, right? Now, Norcross will say, tell you that uh, therapists will often say that they learned really a lot about how to do therapy by being in therapy. But there's no evidence. You don't have to be a whale to write Moby Dick. <laughs> right? And you don't have to be in therapy to do it. it it's, just, it's just silly uh, on its face. It's not deliberate practice enough. You need to find out your errors. And by the way, if you feel overwhelmed by deliberate practice, and it is overwhelming when you first hear it, your goal's too big. Pick something really small. I am talking about those basics to come back to this question. That basic listening having the client feel like you heard and understood them. You know, I left that behind years ago after grad school. I got that thing down. No, you didn't because that client didn't feel heard. And so I've got to extend my ability to make that connection happen. So, no. Would I suggest therapists go to therapy? If they need it, yes. There is some data that suggests, and it makes sense if you think about it, that if you're in therapy at the time you're practicing therapy, that your outcomes are slightly poorer. But maybe that's because you, you need the help. And of course, I say, if you need it, you should go. But if you don't need chemotherapy, it's really nasty shit to take. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. There was yes. one. Yes. Yes. Um, yes, Next. interesting. I, I go to therapy, and my, one of the goals is professional development. <laughs> one of the goals is professional growth. Yes, right, professional development, yes, in, in specific areas. So I wonder if that makes a difference. But then I have another um, more, if you could comment on this, but this more humorous question a little bit. I, have, I had a book come out in 2009 and 2010 and got a lot of recognition and invitations to teach and so forth, and I thought that was great. But here, what it made me think about is this. I wonder if you know, the great mothers and fathers of psychotherapy, the people revered, uh, Every from, from Adler to Donald Meichenbaum to, to yourself, let's say. But you're not included in this question, though. I wonder if a lot of those people got um, recognized, and not necessarily for doing the best therapy, but they're just the ones who happen to write the books and articles about it. Yeah, uh, I, if, I hate if that. It, if it wasn't evidence-based, you know? I, I hate to say, but for many of 
let me just say it this way. The next time you go to learn a model, don't ask what the model's outcomes are. Ask what the teacher's outcomes are using their model. You hear me? It's critical. It's a critical distinction. I think all clients should be asking their therapists, what are your outcomes? What are your outcomes? Tell me how effective you are and what your plans are if you're not effective. What are you going to do? I, I would love to see that happen. And people become famous for lots of reasons other than their outcomes. Um, I'm sure that many of these people were really quite effective. But I also think that some of them become famous because they were good teachers, which is a reasonable thing to become famous for. Freud was a great teacher, a great writer, a pioneer. Was he effective? You know, mm -hmm. I don't know. And in some cases, I think he did us a favor by publishing things that weren't so great that, that happened. Yeah. Or, or, yes, we, we or some of the people because they're charismatic or their work got promoted right. well or because they were lucky, what, whatever. Perfect. Perfect. I think it's great that you're working on effectiveness, you know, Thanks. as opposed to those other things. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, sorry, you've been so patient. That's okay. Thank you for your talk. Uh, would you consider uh, ongoing clinical supervision as a form of deliberate practice and, uh, and or teaching and training others in psychotherapy? And are either of those two better than doing or equivalent to doing your own deliberate practice? You know, the supervision literature is really t a tough read. Um, first off, it's very disorganized. Uh, there's virtually no data uh, about its effects. And the data that does exist suggests that supervision, at least the way we've traditionally done it, doesn't seem to improve outcomes to clients. Now, I'm going to give that field the benefit of the doubt and say nobody's really looked at this. This is all new, this measurement of outcomes. But before I got supervision, I'd want to know the outcomes of that supervisor. And I'd also want to measure my outcomes to ensure that the more supervision I got, the better the outcomes were with my clients. Okay. Now, but you know, this is all pie in the sky. We're at the beginning of recognizing that outcomes are going to be critical in the discourse between us and payers, us and the consumers. Okay. And maybe a second uh, question. When our students are learning multiple different modalities of psychotherapy yeah. at the same time, yes. is, are they any less likely to, to master them if they, let's say, are doing, engaging in some kind of deliberate practice, let's say they're learning CBT and family therapy at the same yeah. time, uh, and they're trying to engage in some deliberate practice around their CBT and their family therapy, yeah. is there any evidence to show that focusing on just one modality at a time would yield better outcomes or learning? There's none that I know of. Derek, do you know of any? So, no, I, I, I you know, this is, these are fabulous questions, great doctoral dissertations. We just don't have... We don't have any data about it. You know, I guess we could use folk wisdom and say that uh, my son Michael right now, for example, he's 12, and uh, they have him taking Spanish and French. And frankly, he can't speak English very well. <laughs> <laughs> so what should he do? He should be deliberately practicing English and then maybe picking up this other thing. In addition, you know, studying out of a textbook, you know, how far can this take you? You know where the, you can ask for the bathroom and count to one to 10. What you really need to do is be in this, uh, absorbed in it, and have people commenting all the time. And that's a rare opportunity. At one time, the field had that. We don't have that so much. And the equality of outcomes seems to support that, that, that uh, uh, the, the, the lack of those institutes any, lang uh, any longer. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, one more, yes. Hi, Scott. I saw hey. you in Columbus, and you just uh, thrilled me with FIT. And I've been using a form of FIT for six years, yeah. and it's, it's improved my practice immensely. But I want to go to the next level. I want to videotape the same way the NFL videotapes their players and watch the game tape on Monday. Yeah. I'm challenged by the technology, though. Can you direct me in any way? Of Use your cell phone. Use your cell phone. Sit it right there mm -hmm. and video your session with your cell phone. Um, secondly, I don't advise you to tape yourselves, just so you know, not unless you have a coach. Because video information is so dense, you won't be able to sort out what's good and bad. And I promise you, because I know all of you, you are hard on yourselves. There's nothing worse than a therapist's critique of their own self, you know, after they're done with a client. Then they're right back on themselves, sort of beating them, themselves on the back. So when you watch your video, you're going to notice everything that is unimportant that you did wrong. And you will, miss, you will disrupt the things that you do naturally that are good. 
So you have to, before you start videotaping, you need to set very specific process objectives, and you need to have a coach whose work you admire, want to emulate, and who has known outcomes, and, and have them watch sections. So let me give you one hint. If you're going to watch your video, watch the first five minutes. Just that first five minutes, how you introduce yourself, how you have people sit in the chair, what you say to people, and what you're looking for is engagement on the part of the consumer. Just something real small here, but get a coach. Don't do this on your own. Yeah. Can I just ask, what is the difference in terms of the practice between deliberate practice and actual practice? Practice is when you go in your office, this is the way I would use it, when you go in your office and you see your clients, that's your practice. Yeah. Right? Deliberate is, means that you are reflecting on the work and planning for the next work that's going to take place. Uh, so you're not doing practice. And these top performers, it's simply a matter of time. Let me make one more comment and then I'll let you go. Don't be discouraged. This takes time and you're going to see minimal improvement over a longer period of time. That's exactly how it works. There is no come to Jesus moment when you get the whole thing. That it just won't happen, but you'll be better and your clients will be better off as a result. Thanks for coming to hear me, everybody. Thank you.